There are two islands in Hawaii set aside from the crush of contemporary life, Lanai and Molokai. Life is different here in real and subtle ways. Some would call it slower, others would call it perfect. The tall sea cliffs of Lanai have been a formidable greeting to ocean travelers since the mists of early time. It is a hard land. Here, Kamehameha I built a fishing village for his pleasure. Today, this place of worship is the solitary witness to a time past. Although accessible from neighboring Maui, Lanai was left alone by the ancient Hawaiians. Strong were the legends of ghosts inhabiting the island. It was not a place for man. Today, the wind still whips through the mysterious rock formations, evoking stories from Irene Perry, who grew up not far from here. You know, when we lived down Kiomoku, we had to come up sometimes to get groceries. And so my sisters, brothers, and we all come up on horseback and ride through here and spend the day up in the city. And then in the evening, we'd leave about 2 o'clock or so and drive home, uh, ride home. And then when we get to this area here, we would just let the horses go. We just <laughs> hold the pummel and just let the horse take care of everything. And we'd just ride down because they told us that this little place was when you come up with food and everything like that, things like that, that you would, they would call, and that scared us, so when we'd get here, we would run. She tells the story of Ka'ulu La'au. They would say that there was, this was a devil island we all, <laughs> that's why that, uh, King sent his son over to get rid of the, um, I mean, he was naughty and all, so they said, put him to Lanai and let him stay there. And if he got rid of all the devils or all those, you know, then he could uh, build a fire and then they, they know that he's okay. And so when he did get all the, this, what you call it, the devils or whatever, then uh, he did and he got all of them killed. and. So he built a fire and the father sent for him and he went back to Maui. The edges of Lanai may be rough, but the heartland is rich. Owned and operated by Castle and Cook since 1961, Lanai is a company island producing the company product, pineapples for Dole. The lives of many are centered here in the fields. Our planters are very special people, and as you can tell from looking at them, it's really backbreaking work. And uh, to be doing this for a period of many years requires some sort of um, dedication. Or they they come from the Philippines, as you may know, uh, and uh, they come from different types of lives. They uh, find. Uh, you know, we have easier jobs, but they find planting as being their niche. So for our plantation, we're really grateful that these guys are here to do this very hard work. <laughs> An average, we call 100% planting as being uh, able to plant 6,000 plants. Many of them are planting uh, 10,000, 12,000 plants per day. We are beginning a process of developing the island. 
but we have been the mainstay on this island for many, many years, since the 1920s. Uh, a large percentage of our residents work for Dole, and uh, uh, we're continuing to be very optimistic that they'll continue to uh, give us the kind of Dole quality that we've been known for. Yeah, it's been difficult to lure young people back to Lanai because the main industry is pineapple. As you can tell, people go off to college and they study different things that you don't find really uh, jobs really available to them here. So it's been very difficult to bring young people back. Uh, primarily, I moved back uh, because I wanted to raise my children in an atmosphere like this. I remember what it was like uh, in my days, and I wanted to share that with my children. Well, I think basically the uh, oneness of the family, you know, where family and community is important. Uh, the value of hard work and uh, how difficult it is to earn money, um, why education is important. And hopefully, you know, my children can find it here for them. Now, this is what I thought I learned when I was young. Two thousand people live here in Lanai City. There's no traffic light, no movie theater, no bowling alley, nor disco. Two large hotels are being built by the company, but for now, there's only one place to eat after dark, and that's about all. Well, nothing else, I guess. Just stay home and enjoy your TV. <laughs> The tall Norfolk pines grace the skies of Lanai City. George C. Monroe, manager of the Lanai Ranch Company, imported thousands of trees from New Zealand at the beginning of this century. In the city park, residents take a break from their work. Matthew Mono sings a song he and his grandmother wrote, capturing the unique charms of their Lanai island. Lanai is covered with pine fields. Such a beauty from the air. No tall buildings to crowd us. Such a life no one can compare. White sand beaches, rocky shores. Kiawe trees, everyone knows, everyone knows. Slow and easy our lives go. With no rushes of no crowd. At night there's hardly any call. is our star. White sand beaches, 
rocking shore Kia Bay trees everyone knows everyone knows The tallest things are our pine trees And all of the people who The handful of stores stock groceries, garments, and gadgets. Fashion styles reflect lifestyles. Basics like jeans and work shirts are easy to find, but if your size or sense of style is uncommon, then you shop elsewhere. So we really don't need much of everything except sweatshirts and t-shirts and all that. But I guess when they want to dress up, they get it from Honolulu. They usually go to Honolulu and Omaui and get something nice. Already. I'm going on the first row, the second row now. Today I'm going to start the third row. Okay? So, um, did Tutu come home yet from Honolulu? When she comes home, they will get together here. But do shop early. The stores close at noon for lunch. The tourists are coming to Lanai, drawn by its quaintness and Holopo'e Beach, a classic in white sands and gentle surf. And when the visitor arrives, most likely he is treated to a hula by Elaine Kaopuiki's dance troupe, Nahula Ola'i Kealoha, on the lawns of the Hotel Lanai. So it's great, you know. So that's the only style I know, one style, and I hope to keep it. And my girls have always encouraged me, Auntie, don't change your style of dancing.
When traveling to the east end of Molokai, one notices the road gets narrower and narrower as it hugs the coast. Zenny Sawyer travels it daily to go to work in an environment that is a material for dreams of city office workers. She and her partner, Jill Francis, craft clothes and bags for their company, Haku Creations. They work out of Jill's home. See how nice the ocean is? It's oh, beautiful. Man, yeah. I know. Nice day to be outside. Got any tea on? I'm gonna make some in just a moment okay, here. I'm gonna start on that screen. I gotta finish it so we can get our printing done. All right? Great. Okay. Got any ideas about what we should do with the putt ales? Um we have some t-shirts to do also, so perhaps we can figure out the colors and do the pareos and the t-shirts at the same time. Okay, sounds good. Their skills neatly divide the work. Zenny designs the patterns using symbols drawn from her experiences living on Molokai and from her faith. The lawai that I did here, I have an attachment to it because uh, several years ago, uh, a, a kapuna, an elderly old Hawaiian lady, told me that uh, the lawai represented the backbone of God, and that really stood out to me. So the lawai became real special to me ever since then. So it's things like that, things that I have a, a personal attachment to that I like to do my designs. Someone will say, why don't you do this or why don't you do that? But if it doesn't mean anything to me, I can't get into it. I've been sewing ever since I can remember, actually, uh, must be since at least I was 12 years old. I was taught by my mother and my sister, and we have a line of seamstresses in the family, and I've always sewn as a hobby. So uh, an opportunity to work with Zenny to do that was just right in my line. I was born in Gary, Indiana, and always was drawn towards warmer weather. So when I was able to leave home after graduating from high school, I started moving westward. When I first moved here, I knew no one besides the two people that I came with. It didn't bother me. I simply liked the idea of coming to this beautiful place. and. As I've lived here for 10 years, I've grown to know so many people. I never feel lonely. I do not feel isolated in any way. We started out with just some canvas tent liner material that someone had given us, and we cleaned that up, uh, printed and sewed a few things, and that's how we began our whole capital. Mm -hmm. We're very fortunate in not having, um, having to have a lot of money up front because of that free material that came our way, and just little by little it built, and we were able to buy from yardage, go to bolts of material, to gallons of paint, and just kept rolling from there. Senny was born in Honolulu, but lived most of her adolescence away from the islands. 
She returned to Hawaii for college, where she met her husband, Richard. After 10 years of life in Honolulu, the Sawyers wanted a change. They found it in Molokai. In 76, visited the Valley of Pelikunu on a Labor Day weekend. My husband fell in love with it and decided that was where he wanted to live. The family moved into the remote valley on the north shore of Molokai and stayed for six years. Three more children were born, and they finally moved out to educate their family. Okay. We both have the freedom to still live our own individual lives, uh, to meet our own individual needs, and yet put in time to have this business, which has become successful, not successful in the sense that um, we're making lots of money, but successful in that we enjoy doing it, we enjoy putting in the, the time into it, and people appreciate our work, and we appreciate people appreciating our work. Lauhala, in Hawaiian, means the leaf of the hala or pandanus tree. It also means the weaving that uses this leaf. On Molokai, Lauhala and Louise Kekahuna are synonymous. Actually, um, from all appearance, this is a junk tree, but uh, it gave me good leaves for many years. This is a practically thornless tree, which has only about less than a dozen thorns on the leaves. But this tree had come and had gone in its prime, and it's not producing such long leaves. But whatever leaves that are here are very good and very strong. So I keep coming back to this tree. And I've been with this tree from the time it was in its prime, and it's almost 15 to 20 years. It just breaks my heart. I could remember climbing this tree from one branch to another branch to another branch. Of course, that was 10, 15 years ago. I don't climb trees anymore, but this tree is just beautiful. I have read where even in the burial caves, there were lauhala mattings to cover the dead. So you can see where the Hawaiians used the lauhala way, way, way back. But the, this young generation don't think it's important. It's sad. Most la, lauhala is is um, um, time consuming. The work is time consuming. You got to be dedicated to what you're going to do. And if you do too much things like make lay, make kukui nut, uh, uh, if you have too much different uh, hobbies, you don't tend to put enough time in what you're doing. I've been with Lamhala for 20 years and more, and yet I still find I want to learn more. I want to perfect my work more. And there's a big crack Much of the work in, the in Lamhala goes into the preparation of the leaf. First, uh, it is wound into a coil. This, this particular tree is, is old, so she doesn't, this is not her, her best quality material. But if you're learning, this is all right. It's material to work with. But the longer, the more you weave, the more you want better quality. So you start looking, or you end up planting your own tree. Then the leaf is stripped into uniform widths for weaving. Uh, the older people treasure their strippers, and each one has their own kind of strippers. Some, they have a piece of board, and they insert old phonograph needles. Remember what phonograph needles are? They insert phonograph needles in them and they shop them. And my mother used to make uh, strippers out of uh, sewing needles, putting them between two pieces of board and wrapping it with string. My mom weaved for a long time, but I did not weave until, as my children got older, there was this one incident where my children needed dental work and we didn't have money. So there was four children. My husband worked on a ranch, Bohoka Ranch, and there was a whole goal of Lohala down the beach. And I got permission and I went to get it. And I made the dentist two huge mats to take care of my children's dental bill. Little did I realize that uh, out of necessity comes what you're going to do all your life.
the love for Lohala is, to me, the love, love for Lohala is very great. It's very, I could talk for hours. <laughs> During the day, you will find Kimo Paleka at the airport. The people he serves are most likely unaware that this man is one of the better entertainers of Molokai. It started right out, out of high school. I was entertaining with a rock and roll band at the time. Out of high school, I joined the service. Got out and played rock and roll music from 9.30 to 3.30 in the morning. His mother, Elisa Paleka, sang as a member of the Molokai Trio. Concerned about her son's devotion to rock and roll, she had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with him. The son, too, you know, the Hawaiian music is slowly disappearing somehow. You know, it's fading off, and I think you should start really thinking of your heritage. After that, I didn't care for rock and roll at all. Ah, I love my island songs. This is one of my favorites. Song called Molokai Lullaby. Molokai Aloha. Aloha, I love you, my heart. In my heart, there is a song. My soul, I dare belong for my eyes. All through the years, it's a place ever near to my heart. I hear the wind gently calling me back to the old.